Being patient, we're starting a little late this morning. Now, I don't know why it is this morning, because many of you will have enjoyed a beautiful rainbow over Canberra, but lots and lots of things have gone wrong this morning in terms of who was going to be here at, at certain points. So there's just been a little bit of regrouping uh, to, to make sure that we can... Um, uh, you know, hold this wonderful event today. Um, so firstly, I wanted to welcome you to the National Library of Australia. I'm Murray Louise Ayres. I'm the Director General of the Library. Um, and I really wanted to begin our day by saying that you are meeting here today on a building that stands on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, but also, I think, an organisation and, and a culture that is increasingly conscious that it is standing on the culture, the custodianship, the stewardship of knowledge, country, culture that has gone on in this place for a very, very long time. So I honour the um, elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, past, present and emerging, and particularly thank them for the generosity um, that they have shown and are showing um, us as an institution and sister institutions in sharing culture, knowledge and understanding, especially in this the International Year of Indigenous Languages. I also really wanted to pay my respects and deeply thank my Indigenous colleagues here at the library. Many of you are here in the audience today whose work words, thoughts and deeds are profoundly changing the ways in which we think about our collections, about data and about our mission to serve. Um, and I just really wanted to say that I've worked in collections my entire career and I have long known that our collections here at the library contained deep knowledge that could be much more useful to Indigenous communities around Australia, um, and we're certainly working on that. Um, but after a lifetime in working with collections, over the last year I felt these weird shifts going on in my brain, where I realised that the things that I have thought of as um, archival collections that have their being because somebody kind of created them are actually just a kind of a cipher, just a surface over a, a kind of deep uh, culture and knowledge that is just kind of trying to break through out of that paper. So my understanding about what our collections in this space has, has it, it, it's like taking a, I don't know, um, a complete shift in how you think about your collections and think more about the kind of many voices that are underneath them, just trying to get out. And I think this is one of the things that we really need to think about in terms of digital curation uh, and around Indigenous data is to think, what are we talking about here? You know, whose data is it? Whose knowledge and culture? Whose people? You know, whose, whose identities is it in this data? And how do we think about that in ways that are a little bit different from our traditional custodianship and stewardship roles? So um, I say vive la différence and that we should continue to be willing to be challenged in terms of thinking what is the task that's ahead of us as we try to um, curate data um, in this particular space and especially in the digital arena. So many different things shifting. So I hope that this morning is a way where, is a day where you might also feel those profound, profound shifts where all of a sudden you're thrown off balance after 25 years in the business and think, gosh, I know nothing. Um, they're great moments. Um, so I'm hoping you're going to get that kind of discussion this morning. Um, and it's going to be led by my colleague, um, Dr. Craig, and almost not quite doctor, he's working on the doctorate. I've seen the, the long hand. Um, I think I'm so overwhelmed at the thought that my, my opposite number at IATSIS, Craig, Craig Ritchie, is both running his organisation and just doing a PhD in his spare time. I really <laughs> don't get this. Um, but Craig, of course, is going to... Um, basically um, draw out these conversations between our speakers today, um, some in person and one, we hope, virtually. So, Craig, over to you. Welcome again. Remember whose lands you are standing and sitting on today. Thank you. Oh, um, I don't know why Craig Ritchie... Uh, 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 
guri dangari dangari gotun bari gimbesi wa taya yalangurugu a bandungu ka yalangurugu a balor ka ngaran barangun de kan a ba nane koni nan bari de tinda ngun ngun a barangun de kan uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Craig Ritchie. I'm a Dungadi man. Our, uh, our, that was uh, that me dazzling you with our Dungadi language. Um, uh, for anyone who speaks it, probably adulterating it. Um, I'm a Dungadi man. Our country is Kempsey on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, uh, from the mountains, uh, for, uh, the New England ranges into the, to, to the sea. Uh, can I uh, j uh, join uh, Marie Louise in acknowledging that we're on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people? Pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, and can I extend that uh, respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are here with us today, and all of you? Thank you uh, for coming along uh, today. As you heard, I'm the CEO of the Australian Institute of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, my view, one of the best kept national secrets that the country has, um, but an institution um, that has had and uh, is positioned, I think, to have a uh, profound impact uh, on the way that our country uh, grows and develops. Uh, today's event, of course, is a collaboration between IATS staff, uh, National Library of Australia staff, and Oz Preserves. Uh, a collaboration uh, for which I'm uh, deeply appreciative, uh, deep, deeply appreciative, and uh, want to thank all of the staff that are involved. Um, as you heard, uh, we have three speakers, uh, two of whom you can see, one of whom uh, w we hope uh, you will be able to see uh, uh, online. Um, and uh, we also have various ways uh, to enable people to participate in today's event. Um, uh, obviously, if you are here in the theatre, as we get to uh, the sort of panel discussions where I will morph from CEO into either some combination of David Frost, Michael Parkinson or Graham Norton, um, <laughs> and uh, I'll leave you to determine which uh, of those three. Um, uh, you'll be able to participate, uh, obviously, in person. Uh, if, uh, if you're here but you um, feel uncomfortable about standing and asking a question, uh, there's online options. Now, the fact that I've stood up with a pen and paper will give you some clue that I have had some assistance um, in uh, navigating the online uh, options and, and we have an ability to field questions uh, online. My colleague Anthony over here is going to assist me um, with that. Uh, but we want to make sure that you're able to get a hearing and that you're able to uh, ask uh, the kind of questions that, that you need to ask. This forum is uh, a vital one. It's a vital interest to the Institute um, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we have a particular responsibility at IATSIS. We feel a particular burden uh, to make sure that the, the management of our collection uh, in, in particular uh, pays due regard to the concerns and aspirations of Australia's first people. It is our knowledge, uh, it is our cultures and it is our identities uh, that are intimately concerned here. And so the Indigenous Data Network's interrogation of the processes around data collection the, the, its management, its discovery, its access and its use uh, uh, bears directly on uh, questions that are fundamental to how we at IATSIS uh, go about its business, go about our business. <coughs> our vision uh, at the Institute is a global one. Uh, the first uh, few words of our vision statement are, uh, we see a world. Uh, and it's a particular world. It's a world in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, knowledges are recognised, respected, celebrated and valued. Um, it's of prime importance to the Institute, to the Council um, and uh, indeed to all of our members and stakeholders um, because this is critical to cult the cultural resurgence of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, and all of our staff 
are wholeheartedly supporting that vision by making sure that we care for uh, the collection that we have, we make it accessible uh, and in ways that respect and honour uh, the people who own that knowledge um, and that its accessibility is particularly useful, particularly and especially for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers. Although we're in a bit of a peculiar situation, uh, we're 55 years old this year. Um, the first act that established what's now IATS has passed the parliament in 1964. Um, and in many ways, uh, as a statutory body, we uh, are a direct product of both colonisation and dispossession. 55 white academics, largely male, um, felt uh, an impetus to do something to document and preserve uh, Aboriginal cultures as they understood them in 1964 uh, before, as they expected, we disappeared from the pages of history, um, which manifestly we have failed to do. Uh, and we aim to continue <coughs> that failure in particular. Um, but if they hadn't felt that burden, if they hadn't felt that drive, and if that uh, academic drive hadn't been matched by uh, the, the energy of what some might regard as one of the oddest members of parliament to ever sit in the House of Representatives, uh, Billy Wentworth, um, the institute uh, that I lead and that many of us in this room uh, uh, work in uh, wouldn't exist. Um, now, since 1964, the institute has evolved to become uh, not a backward-looking institution trying to document a culture that was disappearing, but as a forward-looking, proactive institution uh, uh, that uh, seeks to tell our stories and, and give people the opportunity to engage with those stories, to support the cultural resurgence of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and to, to influence the kind of story that this country tells itself about itself and that it tells the world about itself. Uh, and, it's, uh, and we have a, a, one of our core commitments, our organisational values that we uh, are striving to unpack and think about uh, and, and, and operationalise is how we make sure that everything in everything we do we have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice or voices uh, being heard. Uh, so we have to keep um, working at best practice and working and learning from our peers. And so collaborations and events like this are critical for us because uh, we want to hear from you, we want to hear from experts uh, in the particular field uh, uh, under, uh, under consideration today so that we can learn together. Now, as I said, we have three speakers. Our first speaker um, probably needs no introduction, but since she's not here, um, it's probably necessary um, even more to to, to uh, speak a little bit about her. Uh, she, of course, has a distinguished academic record and a proven, and has a proven record as a fearless, uh, I'm not sure that adjective does justice, fearless uh, and articulate campaigner and commentator. Uh, many of us at the Institute feel that the 2018 NADOC slogan, because of her we can, applies particularly uh, to Professor Marsha Langton, uh, who was the first woman to chair our council uh, until this year, when uh, bef uh, before the election, the minister appointed Jody Sizer as uh, chair of the IATSIS council. Professor Langton was described, along with Pat O'Shane, as a fierce, passionate warrior who has shown that we can go places where other Aboriginal people may not have yet ventured, and indeed where many non-Aboriginal people thought we couldn't. Uh, rather than reciting her bio, which um, uh, you all have, uh, I will simply introduce uh, Professor Marcia Langton. She's the founder of the Indigenous Data Network, and today she will speak about its inception at the University of Melbourne uh, uh, in the context of the global Indigenous data sovereignty movement. Um, 
uh, and Indigenous Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. Would you please make her welcome through the ether? <laughs> The sequence is pretty important. <laughs> I can oh, I can see something on this screen. There she is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Marsha. Over to you. Hello. Make her welcome again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, the uh, Ngambri people, uh, where your conference is being held, and I acknowledge the traditional owners here, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. In 2017, uh, the Indigenous Studies Unit, where I'm located at the University of Melbourne in the School of Population and Global Health, organised the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Symposium with uh, the specific aim of developing a nationwide network to empower Indigenous organisations and communities to take advantage of developments in data science and maximise the use of their data resources for community benefit. We also aim to increase awareness of the importance of Indigenous data sovereignty for local Indigenous communities, researchers, government and other related stakeholders and provide information on custodianship, management of and reporting uh, of uh, data, presentation of data, including models of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, following that symposium, we established the network uh, because of the overwhelming agreement that uh, there was a need for a network that brings together experts uh, from universities, institutions, governments and uh, communities. Our partner at that symposium was the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, also the Lowerture Institute. Uh, and we received a great deal of support from the University of Melbourne. Since then, we've established the network. Uh, and uh, you'll hear from James Rose soon about the importance uh, of the work that we're doing and uh, the ideas that we are, are proposing to uh, our network. So one of the things that uh, we found particularly important uh, during the symposium and since is the need to partner with uh, communities who are um, attempting to establish their own uh, data units. Our first partnership is with the Algabonia Data Unit in Shepparton. And uh, <clears throat> with uh, Algabonia and the assistance of the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare uh, and other agencies, such as IATSIS, we are identifying ident uh, best practice in community data collection, management and access, applying best practice in data management. Uh, we've already formed a technical uh, subcommittee of our steering group. Um, we have a, designed a survey uh, for identifying those Indigenous data sets that exist. We have, for instance, already identified four orphan data sets uh, with a view to integrating and archiving Indigenous data sets and preventing the orphaning of important data sets uh, which would be detrimental to communities. 
Um, we are working with the Indigenous Research Exchange to develop guidelines and best practice case studies for research and data analysis. And we are developing um, educational programs. And so the steering group consists of uh, the chair, Professor Sandra Eads, in the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne, Professor Sean Newen, Director of the Post Centre for Indigenous Health, uh, Associate Professor James Ward from the South, South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, Craig Ritchie, the CEO of IATSIS, Kalinda Griffiths, Dr. Kalinda Griffiths at the University of New South Wales, um, Professor Janet McCalman, um, and Dr. Linda Norman Parker and Dr. Kristen, Dr. Kristen Smith from the University of Melbourne and Len Smith, who's there with you today. Um, that's enough from me for the moment as an introduction to the Indigenous Data Network um, and our rapidly developing program of works. Thank you, Marsha, uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. James Rose. Uh, he's a senior research fellow with the Melbourne University School of Population and Global Health in the Indigenous Studies Unit, where he is the coordinator of the Indigenous Data Network. Prior to his appointment, he had long experience in Indigenous communities and organisations, developing information systems that supported their programs and objectives. Uh, Dr. Rose will explain the technical basis on which the network operates and including key terms, definitions, strategy, uh, and I'd like to welcome him now. Thank you. Would you give him a welcome? Thanks, everyone. Uh, before I start, let me reiterate our thanks to the Ngunnawal people. Uh, in my previous incarnation as a forensic social anthropologist working for a native title representative body in Redfern, uh, I helped conduct quite a bit of research in this region uh, for a prospective native title claim. The last claim that I worked on was just to the east of here on the south coast. Um, uh, it's been documented in the media, so if you're interested in the kind of work um, that generates data, then that would be a good place to start. The, you've heard the introduction from Professor Langton. The way that we're going to roll from here is that I'm going to go through the technical terms and definitions um, that underpin the work we're doing at the IDN uh, and the standardised language that we want to build nationally to begin creating a consistent uh, discussion around uh, policy in this area. And then I'll be followed by uh, Dr. Len Smith, who's going to talk a bit more about the specific um, development uh, and partnerships um, that constitute um, the IDN. If you have a Twitter account, please follow us on Data Indigenous. Okay, there we are. Now, am I controlling the slides or is, okay. Great. The first term and definition <laughs> that we have to talk about, and which is very hard to find literature on, especially in this particular space, um, is that of data. What do we mean by data? And particularly, what do we mean by Indigenous data in this context when we're talking about curation? I'm going to rewind a little bit into my uh, anthropological and linguistic training and talk about where data sits in a development chain, okay, a semantic development chain uh, that all people um, participate in, all cultures have this kind of uh, production process, which starts with human experience of the world at a physiological and neurological level. What happens when each of us moves through space and time and interact with one another is that we detect what are effectively changes, physical changes in our, in our environment, changes in uh, the electromagnetic environment which are converted by our sensory systems into cognitive processes. And I am going to get to data eventually. What, what this means is that each of us has a universal set of equipment for detecting sound as changes in air pressure, 
changes in electromagnetism, which we detect as sense, uh, and changes in the wavelength of light, which we call sight. And what happens when those changes are detected by our sensory equipment is that it's processed uh, in our brain at a, at a subconscious level and cognized so that we can react in different subconscious ways according to the immediacy of those detections. What makes human beings so special evolutionarily is that uh, we have developed a very sophisticated capacity for uh, symbolic construal or realization of that experience in the form of language. Uh, so other species have limited forms of language, but Homo sapiens and possibly other hominins before us have an extremely sophisticated capacity um, for language. And what language allows us to do is realize meaning. We generate meaning from our experience. So on the one hand, we're moving through space and time, we're interacting with each other. Our brains are processing changes in our physical, uh, chemical and electrical environment. And then we're cognizing that, just like all the other animals that we share the planet with. But what we do with language is generate a, a very elaborate, uh, layered system for turning that experience into meaning. And without going into too much detail, what we get out of that is information. So, information is a universal product of human experience using language to create meaning. All cultures generate information. Information is the specific domains of experience that have been transformed using specialized domains of language, specialized types of language. So in the academy, we talk about faculties and departments and schools and so forth, which reflect increasingly specific branches of language for realizing meaning, which allow us to do increasingly effective things to the world around us and to each other, and be it in medicine or engineering, computing, and biology, or whatever. Literature, art, music, it's the same. What happens once we've specialized those areas of language sufficiently is that we are able to quantify elements of those languages into characteristic units, characteristic uh, traits which we can assemble into collections. And it is those characteristic traits that we refer to as data. Data are the characteristic attributes of already specialized domains of language, which we call information, that we can count. That's what data is. And it's, it's the same in every single field. So when you're creating a spreadsheet and you have columns, what you're doing is distinguishing characteristic attributes from the field of language that is already specialized that you're using to create meaning about a specific domain of experience. Okay, we all do that. Even outside of the academy, we do that. We do it when we learn to tie our shoelaces, for example. We, we learn to go to the toilet as small children. I can say having had small kids, that's quite an elaborate process. And at the end of it, if we turn that into a specialized field that can be reproduced in a controlled environment like the academy, then we get data that we can count. So what's very important to this conversation about indigenous data is the concept of property. The World Economic Forum in 2011 released a paper in response to burgeoning pressure from Web 2.0 participants. When I talk about Web 2.0, I'm talking about uh, the, the dominant media platforms of the internet with which we engage actively. Social media, for example, Amazon, eBay. Uh, these are not static articles on pages that we used to read back in the 90s. That was Web 1. Web, web 2.0 is a participatory environment and people are contributing incredible volumes of information to the platforms from which they in turn receive a service. The World Economic Forum in 2011 uh, said that uh, this, this economic activity, which is what it is, uh, does in fact constitute a form of intellectual work on the part of people who are participating on the internet as clients rather than service providers. And as such, it generates uh, an asset, it generates uh, something with financial value. So they describe this as an emergent asset class, a new asset class, data, personal data specifically, which is uh, comparable to tangible assets such as real estate, 
and infrastructure. Then, uh, around about the same time, the International Accounting Standards Board and the IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, consolidated their standards to reflect uh, this uh, refined definition of data as a form of property generated by work uh, to fall into line. So that now, um, before we go any further, last year the European um, Union, I think, uh, released the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which explicitly describes the data that is held by Web 2.0 platforms such as Facebook, Twitter and others as the property of the people who generate it. And that each European member nation has a data protection authority, as a consequence, to whom individuals can report breaches of that regulation and request that all their data be deleted. And you might have heard of this in terms of the right to be forgotten, which that bit of uh, legislation now enshrines in the European Union. We don't have that in Australia. We have layers of privacy regulation, but it's not the same thing, especially when we're talking about Indigenous data. What is Indigenous data? The concept of indigeneity is the product, the inherent product of a colonial exercise, such as that that was undertaken in Australia. Otherwise, there would just be Australians. What happens, uh, what has happened in Australia, can be characterised as a, an organised unilateral asset transfer from Indigenous people, in the first instance to Britain, and after the devolution of governance by Britain to the Australian Commonwealth, thereby to the Commonwealth, which now resides primarily in this city. Uh, the staggered nature of that um, asset transfer started off with land, the alienation of land in a wholesale act of appropriation of the continent of Australia. Uh, it was then followed quickly by the alienation of natural resources. Uh, alienation meaning, of course, that um, people who originally enjoyed access and use of those resources are prevented from being able to access and use those resources. Alienation means to be locked out of. Um, it was followed then, the alienation of natural resources was followed by the alienation of labour, which we know as stolen wages or slavery in other parts of the world. And uh, then as the colonial administration developed and became more sophisticated by the end of the um, 19th century in this country, we began to, began to see the development of a specialised language. So I spoke earlier about the development of specialised languages such as uh, biology and chemistry and so forth. In a colonial administration, one of the most important forms of specialised language is that um, which regulates Indigenous people, Indigenous labour and uh, Indigenous owned assets. And we know this today variously as ethnography or anthropology or any of its affiliate branches of specialisation. So these are specialised languages that have specialised terms and definitions and a specialised way of construing meaning about Indigenous people, Indigenous labour, Indigenous land, religion, uh, ceremonial practices, uh, economies and so forth, which seeks to regulate it. So it turns it into a domain of knowledge for non-Indigenous people that can be controlled. And out of this highly refined and distilled formal language, of course, we get data. And this is Indigenous data. Uh, this is how we arrive at the point we're at today. And to contextualise that a little bit, everyone's very familiar with the concept of land rights, and that was an attempt to um, restore or reverse some of the alienation of the, alien of the land that was initially taken by Britain. And we've had um, an attempt to reclaim some of the stolen wages, so we have begun to address as a nation some of the issues around stolen labour, and now we're beginning the slow process of beginning to try and restore the property rights around the appropriated Indigenous data. And sitting in between labour and data, we have information. This is another area of law which is covered by IP, trademarks, copyright and so forth. That's quite well developed. But law around the restoration of Indigenous data is not well developed. And that's what we are aiming to address with the Indigenous uh, Data Network. Len is going to follow shortly and discuss the more specific applied uh, features of that endeavour. So without further ado, I'll hand over to him. Thank you very much for listening. Well, there will be a bit further ado 
um, before Len gets up. Um, and that is a, a brief introduction. Uh, thank you, James, for that. Uh, lots to think about um, in that uh, short presentation. So Dr. Len Smith is an Associate Professor in the ANU School of Demography, a visiting Senior Research Fellow at the Indigenous Studies Unit, uh, Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. He has conducted uh, considerable amounts of research in Indigenous epidemiology and demography. And as you heard today, he will, well, according to my notes anyway, will discuss the importance of linking orphan data sets to enhance policy development and government service and probably anything else he wants to talk about. Len, thank you. Give him a welcome. Uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, and uh, I'll join my colleagues in acknowledging the Ngunnawal people on whose land we meet. Well, I'm hoping... that the balance of slides will come. Given it to someone? Yes, it was the same one. Same oh, that's okay. Oh, now I understand. <laughs> About how far down? Uh, try, try 11, yeah. Up, up a bit. Try 8. Next. 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 Did you want to go forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've, we've had all these. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, we've had a little trouble getting various components of this uh, presentation together. Uh, well, as Marcia said, uh, uh, she convened a National Indigenous Data Sovereignty Symposium in 2017. Uh, uh, and the background to that was uh, not only the international movement uh, in data sovereignty, but also a series of Australian initiatives funded by the federal government uh, to establish uh, uh, what were called empowered communities. Uh, uh, selected for uh, their representativeness around the country. And part of the development of the empowered communities was the development of data capacity within them. Uh, and uh, some of those empowered communities have really forged ahead, including the community at Shepparton that James mentioned. Others have not uh, developed so quickly. And so part of the idea of the network was to take the lessons uh, from those that have succeeded and try and uh, generalise those so that they could be used by other communities, not just the empowered communities, but any other Indigenous uh, groups who were interested in documenting their own situation and using, it, using that information for their own development. The second component of the network that uh, was uh, identified as a priority was allowing or uh, facilitating the access uh, to government data by uh, Indigenous communities and organisations. Uh, a vast amount of information is collected by government agencies about Indigenous people and communities, uh, and often it's very difficult for those uh, individuals and communities to access the information about themselves. So the, there was, it was recognised that there was a need to free up the flow of information back to the people so that they could document their own situation in the terms that governments used to and use it uh, for their own development. And finally, uh, the third priority that was identified was the sort of rescuing of a vast array of uh, Indigenous data sets, uh, which we've termed orphan data sets in the sense that uh, they were once uh, uh, well and established within uh, a family network, uh, but uh, through the passage of time have been neglected and were endangered of being lost. And there's a very large number of those 
uh, not generated by government, by indigenous organisations themselves, <coughs> and by researchers. So the idea was that we should get a, a picture of what's going on in these three uh, priority areas, uh, get some resources, uh, and uh, uh, start to uh, move on all fronts at once. Uh, and an important component of that was the idea of uh, uh, capacity development, that this, this, this had to be an indigenous empowerment process as well as anything else. So we want to see this network uh, generating a cadre of uh, indigenous data scientists. The, as Marcy said, we, the steering committee was set up. Uh, and we've now set up a uh, technical advisory group uh, to help us with the process. The, speaking in very general terms, uh, we thought that the priorities can be defined as being about data on people, on country, and on language and culture. And of course, you know, there's a range of challenges. Uh, this uh, institution that we're uh, meeting in is one of the components of the sort of ne network of, uh, of organisations that need to be marshalled in order to address that. Uh, and everything we conceive of is, a part, is in terms of a partnership, not only with NLA, but especially with IATSIS, but a, a whole range of other government and non-government organisations as well. Uh, and What's the aim? The aim is to preserve the data, to make it generally accessible, and to allow it to be reused, to be shared, uh, and to be integrated. Well, uh, this is more or less going back over the uh, over those uh, priorities that I mentioned. Um, the, I, I think it's important to stress that the, the, the empowered communities com component is already a demonstrated success, uh, uh, especially in the area of uh, restorative justice, but also in school attendance and so on. Uh, communities have developed their, uh, have demonstrated their capacity to use information in order to deal with priority issues that they themselves have identified. Well, to get down to real specifics, uh, uh, what we want to do is create, develop, uh, establish and develop relationships with the key organisations in the government so that uh, Indigenous organisations uh, and uh, communities can access information from the census, uh, which is the main, main source of information about Indigenous people but also all those other uh, huge uh, official data collections which contain information about uh, uh, Indigenous people and communities like Centrelink, Medicare, hospitals, birth, deaths and marriages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, there are issues of ownership, of confidentiality and so on, uh, particularly when, when you look, address the issue of uh, Indigenous access and researcher access. But that's why we've got this network uh, being set up, so that we can address those issues. Uh, without spending too much time on it, uh, my own sort of main concern is, is about orphan data sets, and I know it's Marcia's concern too. Uh, all around the country, uh, since uh, uh, data started being collected uh, by Europeans, uh, people have uh, documented uh, Indigenous genealogies and family histories. Some of those records are well uh, developed. Some of them are very poorly developed. Many of them are in danger of being lost. They need to be uh, rescued and put on a sustainable footing. Community surveys, same thing applies. Uh, 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 countless surveys have been undertaken of uh, indigenous communities, where is all that data? Well, we know where some of it is. Uh, uh, it all needs to be documented and drawn together so that 
people have access to the information that, about the history of their own communities and organisations. Health surveys, uh, the particular obsession I have is with the National Trachoma and Eye Health Program, which Fred Hollows ran. They, they did a clinical uh, examination of over 100,000 people. Uh, that information is sitting uh, largely in paper in a basement somewhere. It needs to be rescued and, uh, and used as a baseline for contemporary research. Land, water, environment, crucial to, to the whole process of native title and land rights, uh, and so on. Uh, I could uh, spend the whole day talking about all of the orphan data sets that we need to identify, document, put on a sustainable footing, and make it available to uh, communities and organisations. Well, the, the vision we have is one of uh, full spectrum curation, which means the, uh, all the high value data sets that we're interested in are a mixture of pieces of paper and old media, CDs and uh, data tapes and so on, and very up to date uh, uh, databases as well. So, so it's not, just a, it's not just a data science question, it's an archiving question, it's a, it's a curation question in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, with the idea that uh, you start at diff very different points of digitisation, of uh, machine readability, but you end up with something that's shareable by the most modern means we have, usually via some sort of web interface. And uh, I just want to say that uh, we had high hopes that the federal government's increase process, the collaborative research infrastructure process, might provide the answer to all this, uh, because they were addressing th this issue in the, in the broad, uh, in terms of uh, uh, digital humanities and social sciences, which they regarded as covering Indigenous data. That process has stalled for a variety of reasons and it's our belief that the Indigenous Data Network in a way can, can leapfrog that uh, uh, because the, the key to success in other areas has been not just the sort of partnerships I've been talking about so far between Indigenous people and government organisations, uh, 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 communities and so on, but also a partnership between sort of people who are involved in the subject matter and the computer scientists. And the two successes that we've seen uh, in this uh, uh, sort of partnership are firstly a very successful London group that has uh, uh, been involved in recreating the, the Anglo-Saxon history of Australia, uh, of, of uh, the UK essentially. Um, uh, but also we look at our colleagues in genomics and the difference between th them and the social scientists is this intimate partnership between the subject matter specialists, the archivists and the computer scientists. And that's what we're trying to turn this network into. So that's about it. Thanks, Craig. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Len, and thank you uh, for our three speakers. So we now move to questions, and uh, we have roving mics. We have a couple of mics for our two uh, folks down the front. And can I just remind everybody that as this event is being uh, recorded and live streamed, can you wait until you have a microphone before you speak? Um, uh, so that you'll be heard, uh, but also captured um, and uh, forever and forever. And um, it would be great if you could identify yourself briefly uh, when you um, ask the questions. Um, and as I said before, there is an opportunity through the Facebook comments for you to um, send in your questions um, and they'll be relayed to the tablet down here through the 
mysteries um, of the um, ether. Um, and um, we'll be able to make sure you get those questions asked. And um, I can see Marcia here. Um, you can't see Marcia there. But we I, can you hear us, Marcia? I can't hear you. You might need to unmute your microphone. Um, there you go. Okay. Can, great. All right. So let me just slip over here and... Do we have an opening bid for a question? Way up the back. If you could just, uh, I know yeah. you're shy, but if you could stand up and identify yourself and. Uh. Hello, I'm Bronwyn Coop from AATSIS. Thank you all very much. Um, you've answered a lot of my questions about exactly what Indigenous data is and. Um, where organisations uh, like ours have a part to play. Um, you've talked a bit about learning from successes and I'm just wondering if you could help me to visualise that by unpacking a bit around the Shepparton example. Is that question to anyone in particular? Um, well, I think a number of people talked about it. James, I think in particular... We, we you mentioned it? Yeah. We, we might just give that one to Marcia. Do you want to talk a, bi oh, a bit okay. about the, the Shepparton project, Marcia? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, good question. So, um, the Kayala Institute in Shepparton is the lead organisation in the Empowered Communities Network. And the, the region around Shepparton um, is an empowered communities region. They've been working for some years with the other leaders from the other empowered communities regions to develop a, um, an approach uh, that involves uh, local community organisations and local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations in uh, planning and prioritising um, policy, policies, funding and implementation of, of programs in their regions. In order to do so, Shepparton, uh, the, 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 sorry, the Kayala Institute in Shepparton has developed the Algabonia Data Unit and other um, <clears throat> empowered communities regions are doing likewise. So there's one in Kununurra also in, uh, and the East Kimberley is also one of the empowered communities regions. The uh, <clears throat> The, um, the point of having local data units is to, uh, well, first of all, to collect their own data. Um, so, uh, for instance, by doing household surveys, community surveys, um, having consultations with the community to develop uh, a view of local priorities. So in, in uh, the Golden Valley region uh, around Shepparton, one of the local priorities is um, early childhood education. Um, and that is one of the 56 priorities that the community has developed. And they've worked with an epidemiologist and um, others to um, combine their local data with existing data from the ABS and so on um, to get a picture of their own region and so I think when I uh, realised when I realised that this was the work that they were doing and that they developed a community report card, I, I thought, well, this looks to me like Indigenous data sovereignty in practice, developed locally without um, any particular knowledge of Indigenous data sovereignty, but an organic movement to empower local people and to develop priorities and to. Uh, collect, use and interpret data for local priorities. And so that is an empowerment process. And we've partnered with them in order to assist them with technical advice and to further develop their model and also 
uh, to work with the other com empowered communities regions to uh, formalise and perhaps uh, make more uniform a sort of national indigenous data network of local community data units like the Algabonda data unit. Um, does that answer to your question? Uh, Marcia, I might follow that up with a supplementary. Um, do you think uh, what we're trying to achieve or, or uh, would it be... I think it's interesting that the, the, this has sort of begun with empowered communities if, uh, because that's a particular way of framing uh, I interaction and relationship with those communities. If there wasn't an empowered communities uh, sort of framework in existence, uh, and there wasn't, in the context of that, some regional or local institutional capability, uh, would the sort of things we're trying to achieve be possible? Uh, well, it was... Discovering the Algabonia Data Unit um, arose from the University of Melbourne partnership with the Golden Valley Region and the University of Melbourne contribution to the development of the Kayella Institute the Academy of Sports and Health Education and uh, the work that we're doing to ensure that, that local Yorta Yorta people and other Aboriginal people in the area enrol in um, award courses at the university. Um, when I sent out the invitation to the data symposium, uh, the Algabonia data unit put their hand up and I realised that they, a paper from them would be an excellent demonstration of, of uh, the needs of communities. But as it happened, um, all, the symposium was held before the um, actual development of other data units in the country. But um, through our network, we knew of other programs and they're not involved in the empowered communities um, network at all. So, for instance, my colleague, Dr. Linda Norman Parker, has been working at Wadea for many years in the Northern Territory, um, where he and his team have digitised 40 years of um, community audio, video, photographs, uh, much of which concerns their cultural life, uh, their church life, their funerals, their sporting events, community events. And he uh, set up a television intranet, um, which is broadcast... So that, so that the digitised community archive can be broadcast on television screens in the community. So people from Wadea came to present because um, that is another case of data sovereignty in practice. Um, and so they received all of their master tapes back from the Institute, the Institute Archive, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies archives the master tapes. And that's quite a different um, scenario from the Shepparton scenario. We also had um, the uh, project from the um, Yaru people in Broome. So the Yaru have a native title determination and uh, agreements and a very sophisticated um, native title corporation. The Yaru people wanted to do their own household survey and they um, partnered with Mandy Yap at the, at the ANU and they presented on their household survey and why they were doing their household survey so that they want to have their own population data and the sorts of questions that they want to ask Yaru people in order to develop um, their community according to the priorities of the community. So there's a different uh, scenario. Um, and so as it happened it, during, in, in creating the conference, we ended up with six of these local data sovereignty efforts and each one looks a bit different, but each one of them raised the problems that we are now addressing. So would there uh, be a, a potential for um, what we are doing to meet the needs of local communities? I think in many different ways, the answer is yes. So amongst the uh, orphan data sets we, uh, um, throughout the nation, we suspect that um, land councils, Aboriginal medical services, Aboriginal legal services, 
a range of corporations and other types of Aboriginal organisations have often data sets from um, you know, years of operations uh, that are not digitised and are not able to be used by the communities. Now, of course, it's impossible for us to say at this stage that you know, an ideal world would be the digitisation of all of those data sets, but we first of all need a survey of those data sets and to identify the ones with the highest priorities. And I imagine that the highest priority would be at this stage, the ones that are most vulnerable and at risk. And also those data sets, such as population data sets that are important for um, say critical health interventions. Terrific, uh, thank you. Uh, the um, elves have told me that there are no Facebook questions yet. Um, uh, please don't let Facebook just be the home of polarised arguments. Um, uh, let's use it to uh, pose some uh, knotty but really important questions. Um, I'm going to throw to the room though. Any for any? Uh, who's going to ask the next question in the room? Oh, there's a hand up the back. Also another shy person, but. Um, I'm Fiona Blackburn. I'm from IATSIS. I'm interested, Len, in what you were saying about the orphan, the health surveys, um, in in the context of the very local uh, focus that Marsh has been talking about. Some of those health surveys, I should imagine, would be, uh, you know, national, cover great swathes of the country. How would, how are you thinking that the relevant data might be returned to communities? To local communities that could use those subsets of that data. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. Um, well, well, we're entering a new era in Australia in terms of uh, data access uh, as a result of some Commonwealth initiatives, uh, essentially started by the Productivity Commission. And the what, what's come out of that process is that, as far as Commonwealth data is concerned. Uh, a, a lot of the restrictions on access that existed in the past look like they're going to be uh, removed. Now, that doesn't mean that individual data is going to be made available to anybody who wants it, but it means that we can, we can see through the use of appropriate technology, the sort of technology that's commonplace in, like, you know, law enforcement and national security, or in the health sector, for that matter, where you have graded access to data depending on what your credentials are. Now, there's a whole lot of specific issues involved there when you're talking about Indigenous data because of the issue of uh, uh, Indigenous data sovereignty and ownership. Uh, but, but the technology, we believe that the technology is there that will allow graded access to things like health surveys so that communities can get health profiles without necessarily, you know, prying into their neighbours' uh, relationships with their doctors, uh, that... that uh, Researchers can uh, do epidemiological research, drawing on the data that begins as individual health records, but without jeopardising the confidentiality of those records. And there's a whole area of, uh, of technology associated, associated with what they call the semantic web, which enables this to be done. But, you know, we're talking about something that is going to be some years in the development, I'm sure. But it... But uh, that's what I was saying in, when I was talking that this needs to be done as a partnership between really sophisticated uh, computer science uh, approaches and the communities. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, nothing yet. Uh, there's a question here around the pillow. Thanks everybody, Anna Carr. I'm interested in the extent to which questions or the indigenous data network can be of service. So you've spoken about the capacity for local groups and local organisations to use a network to meet their own priorities and have their population surveys, et cetera, used in combination with national survey data sets. 
is there a, the capacity for the Indigenous Data Network to isolate and show how and where individual communities can use national data sets for their own purposes? That's a great question. Um, one of the aspects of this project that uh, distinguishes it from others uh, is its emphasis on uh, geospatial attribute data. Um, one of the most important things that distinguishes Indigenous data, one of the most important attributes, is its very particular geographic patterning. So that the definition of Indigenous person is fundamentally a temporal and a geographic definition. These are people from Australia who've been in Australia for a very, very long time. If you drill down to more specific subsets of that attribute, you have specific communities with specific kinship relationships that tie them to those geographic areas and to each other over very long periods of time. And those kinship links in turn tie them into adjacent communities. When we're talking about things like health data or justice system mm -hmm. engagement data, they all have a geospatial uh, dimension to them, which is extremely informative and valuable to the community in terms of improving uh, policy and service delivery based on that policy to that community. So knowing, for example, uh, which members of which communities are accessing which health services in which areas. So how can, how can government, say if it is government that's providing a particular health service to a particular area, uh, better, um, better adjust or better tailor uh, the location of that service and the particular expertise that forms part of that service to that community based on the geographic uh, attributes of the data that's being collected. And we have very, very powerful modelling and analytical techniques for helping government and other service providers to do that. Uh, the challenge is really uh, nationalising it, uh, making it national and standardising it nationally so that communities um, can have a coherent and cooperative involvement in the way that data is used for their purposes. Does that, does that answer the question? You look like you're ready to respond, Len. Okay. Uh, Terrific. Now, I should just say that the live stream will end at 11.15. Um, we started late, so we might just uh, um, push on a bit beyond that. Um, now, the live stream, though, will be available on the IATSIS, NLA and Auspreserves YouTube's YouTube pages uh, after the event, so you will be able to uh, revisit the event. I'm going to... Uh, take a couple more questions if there are any in the room. We will have an opportunity for informal interaction um, once the event is finished. But there is a question over here and over here. We'll go here and then we'll go here. You, sir. Oh, hi, I'm, thanks very much. I'm Hamish Anderson from Geoscience Australia, the National Mapping Agency. Um, and just to uh, go on with that idea about geospatial data and the idea that it connects. Like at, at GA, we say that everything happens somewhere. And we've started talking much more about digital data rather than geospa or digital mapping, sorry, rather than geospatial data or location information, just because people are familiar with it. Um, but I'm also, I'm interested to know what, um, how place, is being connected in or considered in the Indigenous data network. And you, we talk about the um, having standards, um, you know, national standards and being able to nationalise this. What specifically could we do in government to, um, to, to improve the way these things work? Len. Well, uh, James will probably want to say more, but uh, one of the things that would be great for us is if we had uh, an indigenous geography, uh, if we, uh, which had a historical dimension as well, uh, because a lot of the locations that are important in, in terms of uh, uh, indigenous history in Australia are no longer part of the standard gazetteer. We're talking about names. Not, not the naming of geographical entities. So that would be my <laughs> my response to that. But there's a lot of contemporary issues too, and I think James is probably better to talk about that. Look, I, I, 
look, it's a, it's a phenomenally complicated question. Um, with my native title hat on, uh, all of the data that we collected uh, as part of the evidence development process for native title claims was fundamentally geographic. So uh, in, uh, we developed a technique uh, which you can read about online. So there are videos where I've talked about this previously in other forums called uh, event modeling for a population. So first of all, you need to start in order to really think about this in geographic terms, start thinking about a population as a three-dimensional object made up a single community, a single, uh, a single entity, if you like, constituted not by individuals with discrete attributes like life expectancy and education level and so forth, but characterized by links between them. Each link between a pair of individuals has a geographic expression. It's a geographic expression that can be defined in a number of different ways. If you take one geographic expression of a relationship between the two individuals, it's the birth locations of those two individuals. So straight away, you can begin to unravel what I'm talking about when I mean that indigenous um, identity is a geographic identity because the birth locations of everybody in that single community is inside Australia for 2,000 generations at least. And then within that relational population model, you have specific concentrations of relationships which are distinct to particular peoples with distinct languages and cultures and so forth. So, for example, you know, we talk about Ngunnawal people. These are people whose relationships re recur over and over again in a particular geographic domain, which is the region that we're sitting within today. Now, we move there in that characterization away from a strictly geospatial description to a uh, temporal or temporospatial, if you like, expression. So an event, an event model is a model where each individual event brings together a, a time, a place and an individual which is then linked to other events that includes another time and a place and an individual, whether by kinship whether by a productive relationship, such as participation in a particular industry, whether by ceremonial participation, whether by use of the same language. Are you, feel me? Are you see where I'm going with this? Okay. So we begin to develop much more sophisticated, much more analytically powerful ways of understanding population dynamics, not just for Indigenous people, but for all people, but specifically for Indigenous people where the question really is how do uh, services um, controlled by indigenous communities get uh, properly delivered, right? Tailored and delivered to specific communities, as Craig pointed out earlier, with different needs. And as Marcia referred to earlier, I mean, the, the, the needs and interests of communities in, in the East Kimberley are very different from those in La Perouse or in the Western Desert where I grew up, for example. But this requires a, a, a bit of a paradigm shift in statistics, in demography, in health delivery, I mean, this is a big endeavor. So we're starting at the bottom. The first thing to do is to recognize that we have a huge amount of data that's been collected over more than 150 years, which as Len pointed out, is sitting down in a mixed medium paper. Some of it's on microfilm, some of it's been digitized, some of it hasn't. The vast majority has not been indexed. You know? And this is valuable. This belongs to people and it has a monetary value, not just in productivity dividends in terms of improved service delivery, product, you know, productivity efficiency in terms of policy development, but in terms of the property of real people, just like land, just like labor. Okay? So as Marcia pointed out at the beginning uh, of this Q&A session, the, the first thing we need to do, and keeping in mind that orphan data sets are the priority, is to begin a nationwide survey and audit to find out what actually is out there that is not known right, to the owners of that data so that we begin, just like we did after World War II, begin to link back <laughs> the stolen assets to the people who own it yeah, and then begin to turn it into a more effective modeling and analytical device for those communities. Uh, thanks for the question. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I was going to ask how an how that accounted for diaspora amongst Indigenous Australians. Uh, so 
I'm done, Gary, here, but I'm on Nunawal land. I'm not in Kempsey. Uh, we have Dungari in Melbourne. We have Dungari in, uh, in Adelaide. Uh, so I have slight anxiety about over geographicalizing uh, how we understand Indigenous Australia because that may well obviate uh, and render lots of us invisible because we're not geographically defined anymore. Uh, there was a question over here. Uh, I'm told we can go a little bit over 11.15 with the live feed for those online. Could I just um, say Marcia. something? Yes. Could I say something about uh, your concerns about over-geographicalising the data? Um, the kind of data that uh, James was talking about um, that uh, it motivated him to develop... Uh, the approach that he has was actually uh, genealogical data. Right. So okay. James says that um, well, every entity has a geographic geographical aspect. They also have a genealogical aspect. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wish that uh, James had one of his gorgeous uh, computer-generated images of what uh, a deep genealogical data set over several generations, taking into account all the places where the people have resided and how they've intermarried. Um, so, so that could show you um, how exactly what you're talking about, how a, a core population and its diaspora can be captured by data and the attributes of uh, that population are genealogical, geographical, um, historical and you know and and of course there are several other key attributes. Uh, super. Well, he's here. I'm going to um, have a look at one of his pictures then. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Marcia. Um, there's a question over here, and we have a question online. So we'll just go over here in the room first of all. It, it, it may be the same question that is online because I posted. Are you are you Miriam McBride? No. Then I not. tried posting a question to Facebook. I didn't want to be standing here with a microphone. My name is Catherine Stiles. I work for the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations, of which there are 3,000 around Australia. I'm just wondering whether you're wanting people to organisations to opt in to this, like in that survey, is it open access? Can we start doing it now? It's just, it's very exciting. Just, just make contact. Okay, thank you. We have a website. There, there is a website and, a and, and it, uh, well, and it's really real now if it has a Twitter account. Um, uh, so, does that answer your question? Thank you. But James, why did you not show us one of these pictures? Well, yeah, um, why, James? Why? Yeah, why? <laughs> I didn't realise back. I was back in court. Sorry, Your Honour. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I didn't come here intending to present evidence. I came here intending to explain a, an approach. But you know, we can. I mean, if, if uh, the technicians are around, we can we can unplug one computer and plug in another one if you like. Let, let's save that up, um, shall we? Uh, so I have a question from Miriam McBride, which is a similar question. How do members of the public support this program? What can a regular citizen do to help? Uh, who wants to have a crack at that? Marcia, do you want to have a crack at that question? Um, well, I, I'm just grateful, actually, uh, from what I can't see the audience, um, but I can hear some people um, apprehending what we're talking about. The more people who understand the, the urgent priority for an approach like this, um, the more able we will be to uh, convince governments and indeed communities to uh, not be afraid of data, to share data um, and to um, assist. The, I mean, there's lots of institutional support for this approach that would be most welcome. Um, I think, um, say, so those of us who have our open data sets of our own, um, such as mine, um, it's not quite open yet, um, but it results from three Australian Research Council linkage grants over roughly a 10 year period, uh, gathering together data on agreements with Indigenous people it's all online at atns.net.au. 
It's had no ARC funding for a long time. It's unlikely to get any more ARC funding. Um, and I, I've managed to keep it, uh, it up to date with interns and, you know, scrabbling together 15,000 a year to keep it online. But if I can't do that in the future, it will be an orphan data set. So we have to build into our thinking, how do we prepare for um, data sets to be archived and yet remain accessible before they become orphaned? So I've volunteered the data set, um, the entire collection um, to, uh, as, a, as a subject, you know, as a case study to ensure that we get uh, our, our approach right. So there'll be a number of steps and protocols that we'll have to develop. And I'm sure that there are many other data sets like these hidden in universities and in institutions and just Coughing up the information to us will be an enormous help in the first instance. Well, thank you for that, um, Marcia. I've had the, the elves have told me to wrap up, so um, I am going to draw the formal part of our um, event to a close. Um, but there will be some opportunity, perhaps, to engage the two speakers that are here, at least in some informal conversation outside in the foyer. Uh, so I invite you to do that. Thank you all very much for your participation uh, in the event today. Can I just give Oz Preserves a bit of a plug? Communities of practice like this uh, provide opportunities for practitioners, researchers to come together and to share the, uh, their experience and, and perhaps save themselves from a bit of agony of starting from scratch when they don't perhaps need to start from scratch because somebody's already done something. So it allows uh, a, a, a best practice uh, corpus to be built. Uh, so I hope you found this um, uh, forum to be valuable and encouraging. Can I ask you to give a final uh, round of applause to Professor Langton and Dr Smith and Rose uh, for the uh, uh, presentations that they've given this morning and the information. My head's swimming a little bit, I've got to say. Um, but uh, would you uh, thank them uh, with a round of applause uh, finally, please. And look, finally, I did notice there was a table in the library bookshop with Marcia's two books on it. Um, alas, uh, she'll not be able to sign them um, because she's not here. Um, Geography is important. Um, so, um, but I think they're available for sale in the bookshop um, and uh, I would encourage you to avail yourself of those. Thank you very much. My apologies. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>